If you love spy books, movies, and TV, then the Spybrary podcast is for you. Since 2017, host Shane Whaley and Spybrary field agents around the world dispatch reviews and interviews with authors, historians, and fellow spy fans. We discuss everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Paul Vidic, Graham Greene, Nick Heron, Charles Cumming, Ben McIntyre, and, and many more. Spybrary is available on all good podcast apps and at spybrary.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Spybury Podcast. I'm Adam Brooks, and today I'm joined by Stuart Reed. Stuart is an executive editor at Foreign Affairs. He has written for many eminent American publications, the Washington Post, the New York Times, many others. And his book is The Lumumba Plot, The Secret History of the CIA and a Cold War Assassination. Stuart Reed, thanks so much for joining us on Spybury. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. What a book. This book falls in the category of big book for me. How long did it take to write? You know, I had been telling people it took five years, but then the other week I found an email from 2017. So it actually took six years, you know, not working on it full time the, the whole while, but it took a while to wrap my hands around all the material and then, you know, weave it into a, a narrative. And what material? Absolutely extraordinary detail on the life of Patrice Lumumba, on the Congo crisis of 1960, and this extraordinary moment that really shook the world. So let's jump in. Congo in the late 1950s, this vast country stretching from the Atlantic Ocean deep into Central Africa, a Belgian colony still. Tell us, Stuart, a bit about Congo at this time, what's going on. So the Congo was Belgian colony beginning in 1885, where it was the personal fiefdom of King Leopold II, and it eventually was transferred to the Belgian state in 1908. And what is remarkable about Congo in the late 50s, the mid-1950s and late 50s, is how quickly an independence movement came to the colony. Across Africa, you had calls for independence breaking out much louder and much earlier than they did in the Congo. The reason that there was this difference was that the Belgians really deliberately tried to prevent the emergence of a Congolese elite. This was a fantastically brutal colonial regime, wasn't it? I mean, especially under Leopold II, and then you know, many of the abuses continued. And it was also one where there was a, unlike the French and the British, there was really no attempt to develop any sort of local political institutions. You know, in French West Africa, you had a black colonial governor in the 40s. You had people who were members of the National Assembly in France. In the Congo, they had this idea, no elites, no problems. The idea being that if you prevent any Congolese from getting educated, advancing professionally, meeting with one another, et cetera, you won't have any cries for independence. And this worked until it didn't. Right. So in the middle of this extraordinary wave of sort of decolonizing fervor across the continent, in a strange, brutal colony in the Congo, we have the emergence of new pro-independence leaders, and chief among them is Patrice Lumumba. Tell us about him. He was born in a small village and really has this remarkable rise from very humble circumstances. As a in his late teens, early twenties, he moved like many African men did at the time to a city, city of Stanleyville, now Kisangani, and there he began this rise within the colonial administration, working as a postal clerk. You know, inside the administration, he then gets caught for embezzlement, thrown in jail. While in jail, he writes this sort of political manifesto, and even then, what's striking about that is how moderate it is in retrospect. Part of this was strategic. He was trying to not offend the colonial authorities, but part of it was you know, a genuine snapshot of his political evolution at that time. And he's this tall, rather elegant figure, very charismatic. What's the secret of his ability to work the crowd, to build his political base? Everyone, even his bitterest foes, agreed that he was remarkably charismatic. The US ambassador to Congo, a man named Claire Timberlake, who was no fan of Lumumba at all, once said that if Lumumba had walked into a gathering of Congolese politicians with a tray on his head as a waiter, he would have walked out 
prime minister. And I think the key that Lumumba had was he really effectively combined passionate rhetoric and appeals to emotion with logical argumentation. And he was sort of cerebral yet emotional and interspersed these two elements to great effect. And he also spoke three of the Congo's main languages, which was a huge advantage as well. So by the summer of 1960, the Congo is kind of lurching towards independence. Lumumba is one of many competing people competing for power in the Congo. The other person we should mention at this point, because he's crucial to the story, is Joseph Mobutu. Right. So elections are in May 1960, and Lumumba's party wins the most seats. And so he's asked to form a government and becomes prime minister upon independence on June 30th, 1960. Mobutu, then Joseph Mobutu, later he would rename himself Mobutu Sesi Seiko. He was Lumumba's friend, his protege, his intern in a way. And initially upon independence, Mobutu is given this role as a a low-level junior minister. Everything changes when there's a mutiny in Congo. The black rank and file revolt against their white officer corps, a holdover of colonialism. And Mobutu is put in charge of the military as as army chief of staff. And he had had a background in the military, served for six or seven years, but was mainly a journalist. That's how he met Lumumba as a journalist writing about events for the African news section of a, a newspaper in Congo. So Lumumba and Mobutu, the two of them are central to trying to guide Congo into the early, difficult, unsteady days of independence. And while all this happens, the whole world's watching. The States is watching, Belgium is watching and interfering. The United Nations, the new United Nations is is watching, the Soviet Union is watching. What's at stake here? Why is everybody so interested in the Congo? So to back up just a little bit, so what happens is independence comes June 30th, Immediately, almost immediately, there's a mutiny on July 5th. Then the Belgian military sends in paratroopers across the country, ostensibly to protect Belgian civilians, but it looked like a recolonization where the former colonizer was invading the country. And so Lumumba, desperate, calls on the UN for help. And the UN sets up this massive peacekeeping operation in short order. But it instantly becomes this Cold War crisis, as you say. There's a dispute about you know whether the Belgians will leave and when, and there's a dispute about the province of Katanga, which, adding to the chaos, had announced its secession, declared itself independent, and so that really the crisis was brought to the Security Council and the Soviet Union and the United States. Each couldn't help but view what was happening in Congo through the lens of the Cold War, and. Sitting in the capital, Leopoldville, watching all this is the CIA station chief, Larry Devlin. Tell us about this, this extraordinary man whose actions would go on to really, really shape history in in this part of the world, right? He was very much a man of action. The CIA at this time was, these were sort of the Wild West days. It relied on station chiefs such as Devlin who could make independent decisions and, you know, act on their own. And that he did many times. Devlin was a World War II veteran from San Diego, very much patriotic, true cold warrior. And he viewed Lumumba as a disaster in the making and thought that Lumumba was bent on inviting in the Soviets. And then Congo would turn red, essentially. And there'd be a, a victory in the column for Moscow in the Cold War rivalry. But you seem very clear in the book that Lumumba's leanings are not necessarily communist at all, right? I mean, one of the things that surprised me researching this was how pro-American Lumumba was in a way. He wanted to send Congolese children to American schools. He said that his he wanted his first visit, foreign visit, to be to the United States. And indeed it was. He even signed this multi-billion dollar deal with an American entrepreneur to hand over Congo's mineral and hydroelectric resources to an American. When he goes to Washington, D.C., he even calls on the United States to send American troops to Congo to help put down the crisis there. So these could hardly have pleased the Kremlin. And yet he was 
painted with the brush of communism. And in the American cables, there's all sorts of references to him, you know, potentially opening up the country to Soviet influence. Why do you think Devlin got that so wrong? Why was CIA so keen to paint him as a communist, do you think? I think, first of all, we have to understand the context here is the Cold War, and it truly seemed like an existential struggle. And I think that's very important for anyone writing today about that period to give a sense of how it looked to the Americans at the time. I think also a lot of America's views about Lumumba were informed by reports for the, from the Belgians, who generally hated Lumumba, this you know, anti-colonial rabble-rouser. And so the U.S. ambassador to Belgium, a man named William Burden, he was constantly passing to D.C. You know, reports he had heard from the Belgians, and these were uniformly negative about Lumumba. So there was all sorts of propaganda, essentially, that made its way into American ears. I think the other factor we have to take into account is Lumumba was genuinely erratic, I think is fair to say. He was a classic politician that he'd promise everything to everyone, say one thing one day, sort of when events change, he would change his mind and say something different the other day. So this did not endear him to American officials and allowed them to paint him as unstable and you know, potentially useful to the Soviets. Are you on the hunt for your next thrilling spy read? Look no further. Spybury contributor and Sunday Times chief political commentator Tim Shipman has curated a list of his top 125 spy authors ranked. With Tim's vast experience and expertise in politics and spy thrillers, you can trust his judgment on the best spy authors of all time. This list includes both classic and modern writers, making it the ultimate guide for any spy fan. But wait, there's more. Tim also recommends which book to try first from each author, and he shares his favorite book from each of them too, so you can dive right into the best of the best. Ready to get your hands on Tim's list? Head over to spybury.com forward slash top125 to grab your free copy now. Don't miss out on the ultimate spy reading list. Visit spybury.com forward slash top125 today. And the decision is taken in Washington, D.C. that Lumumba must go. And I know there's been a, a lot of controversy over the years about how and why that, that decision got taken, right? What did you find? It shouldn't be so controversial because here's what happened. On August 18th, 1960, there's a National Security Council meeting at the White House with President Eisenhower present. And he says something to the effect, the exact words are lost to history, that Lumumba has to be eliminated. And we know this a few ways. One, the National Security Council note taker at the meeting would later testify to the church committee, which was investigating CIA abuses, would testify that he remembers this vividly and was asked, was told by his boss not to write this up in the notes. Two, when I was digging around the Eisenhower Library in Kansas, I found handwritten notes from the meeting with the word Lumumba written and a big black X next to it. That's not proof, but it, it is suggestive at least. And then most important, we know what happened next, which is that Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, sets in motion this bizarre assassination plot involving poisons that are flown to the Congo and supposed to be put in Lumumba's food or toothpaste. And when the poisons are handed over to Larry Devlin, Devlin asks, where does this order come from? And he is told it comes from the top, from President Eisenhower. So there, there is really no doubt in my mind that Eisenhower made his desire is clear. We don't know the exact words, but it's clear that this happened. So it was a verbal order as far as you could make out, but we've Correct. never seen any documentation that would, apart from the notes that you found in the, in the presidential papers. Right. There was later documentation about the details of the CIA plot, which was just necessary for the logistics to move forward. But an order like this was never going to be written, but it was clearly said. And in fact, just to add one more piece of evidence, a week after Eisenhower makes these comments, his national security advisor, Gordon Gray, meets with Dulles, the head of the CIA, and basically says, I just wanted to remind you of what our boss said last week, and I hope that you're taking his comments seriously. Do you understand? And you know, the notes say that Dulles understood that 
these comments should be taken seriously. So that's yet more part of the paper trail. I want to just dwell on the poisons for a minute. The man that they send to the Congo as part of CIA's assassination plot is an extraordinary figure, Sidney Gottlieb. Who is this guy? You couldn't make this stuff up. Tell me about Sidney Gottlieb. He was a Bronx-born Jewish man who was very much not the typical blue-blooded Ivy League CIA officer at the time. So he really set himself apart. He was a chemist. He was very smart. He was the CIA's sort of top chemist. And he was also in charge of the very controversial, later controversial MK Ultra program, which involved the use of LSD for mind control. And so anything that involved chemicals or poisons at the CIA, Sidney Gottlieb was in charge of. And he literally flies into Congo with a pouch full of syringes and lethal poison. Exactly. And rubber gloves and a syringe and gauze mask for one's face and instructs Devlin about how to use these poisons. I mean, it's, it's like out of a movie, but it really happened. And he's not the only one they fly in. They fly in a man named Mankel. Now, he was not a CIA officer, right? He was a sort of, a, what was he, a contract operative? Yeah. So there are two European criminals that the CIA recruits because what happens is Devlin, the poison plot doesn't proceed as quickly as CIA headquarters would like. Devlin's having trouble getting access to Lumumba's house. By this point, Lumumba's been overthrown from power, ousted in a military coup, and thrown under house arrest. And Larry Devlin can't get the poisons into the house despite trying. So the CIA recruits these two European criminals were essentially paid CIA agents with underworld connections. And the CIA flies them to Congo. And in a sort of, in this bumbling moment, they both, each is not supposed to know about the other, but they bump into each other at a hotel bar and discover that they're both working for the CIA. And they, especially one of them proves to be particularly unreliable and, you know, talking too much and that sort of thing, bad with this money. This is Sitzvili, right? David Sitzvili. Right, who's yeah. also known by the code name WI Rogue, and Mankel is known as QJ Wynn. And I mean, nothing really happens, nothing really comes of these two figures, but they are sort of this comic relief moment in the story in a way. But also evidence of a weird kind of adventurism on the part of CIA at this point. The whole thing read to me as extremely sort of hazard ramshackle sort of operation. Yeah. I mean, the CIA was still relatively new at that time. It was the outgrowth of the wartime OSS, as you know. And so these were the cowboy days of the CIA when there was basically zero oversight from Congress and barely much more from the White House. So people had a lot of free reign. So as you say, at this point, Lumumba is under a form of house arrest He's been, in effect, ousted from his position as prime minister. Larry Devlin is doing more than just recruiting these bumbling crooks to run around the capital. He is also interfering with politics on a grand level at this time, isn't he? Tell us what happens at this point. What does Devlin now do, and what are the implications for Lumumba? Devlin played a role in removing Lumumba from power. For instance, he was paying street protesters to demonstrate against Lumumba. He was also organizing a vote of no confidence in the Senate that would have removed Lumumba. And Lumumba indeed is fired as prime minister in this legally dubious maneuver by the president of Congo at the time. And then into the void steps Mobutu, who was the head of the army. And he is financed by Larry Devlin and encouraged. And Devlin later says that the coup in which Mobutu took power was arranged and organized by him and the CIA. And that's a really key moment in Congo's history because mm. Mobutu, as listeners may know, ended up ruling the country for 30 plus years and really running it into the ground. And it all began in, in 1960. And Mobutu, once the protege, the friend, the partner of Lumumba, ends up sealing Lumumba's fate along with Devlin, doesn't he? What happens? So Lumumba is under house arrest, and in late November 1960, he makes the fateful decision to try and escape house arrest and regroup in his political stronghold of Stanleyville, the place where he had come of age politically. And he's caught while he 
slips into the back of a car, hiding under the legs of his servants, and travels on for several days and eventually is spotted by an air reconnaissance team arranged in part by the CIA and flown back to the capital, Leopoldville, roughed up in front of Mobutu and then thrown in a military prison. It's hoped he can now, you know, will no longer escape. And the timing is important here. This is December 1960. So the Eisenhower administration is coming to a close. Kennedy's been elected and he's going to take power in January 20th, 1961. And so there's this real fear on the ground in Congo, both in Mobutu's head, and Mobutu's now in charge as the effective military leader, and in Larry Devlin's head. There's this idea that Lumumba might be freed from prison and brought to power as prime minister. Because the Kennedy camp, there had been signs that there'd be some sort of deal, and Kennedy might be more pro-Lumumba than Eisenhower had been. So this is a real fear. And on January 14th, 1961, Mobutu or someone from his circle tells Devlin that Lumumba is going to be sent to his death, sent to another province where it's certain he'll die because the leader of that province has declared his you know, that he wants to kill Lumumba and everyone knows that's what will happen. And so Devlin does two things when he hears this news. First of all, he does not try and talk Mobutu out of this. And they had a very close relationship. Devlin was handing over briefcases of cash to Mobutu. He clearly could have intervened, but he didn't. And in the context of the relationship, that was essentially a green light. And then the other thing he does is he keeps Washington out of the loop. So even as he's updating headquarters about other twists and turns in the Congo, events on the ground, he deliberately sits on the most explosive news in Congo about Lumumba's impending transfer and does not tell headquarters about this because he rightly fears that he'll be asked to intervene and stop the decision. Because this is a transition period. It's been clear in other decisions there are to be no big events happening in Congo before Kennedy takes office. The important policies are matter for the new administration. It's not fair to have big changes on the ground at the end. So by not acting, by not intervening, despite the fact that he's been intervening, intervening for months and months and months, this is an act of non-intervention. He doesn't say anything and he lets events in the Congo take their course. And Lumumba is taken away to Katanga, the secessionist province. And the way you describe this in the book was very shocking. I mean, it's a very, very frightening, brutal moment, isn't it? Yeah. So Lumumba on January 17th, 1961, is flown to Elizabethville, the capital of Katanga, the secession estate. He's tortured the whole flight. The radio operator in the cockpit has to close the cockpit door because he's so upset by what's happening and he vomits. Lumumba is dragged out of the plane in Elizabethville, half alive, taken to a nearby house, tortured further. The leader of the secessionist province, Moise Chambe, gets blood on his suit, comes by and has a turn with Lumumba. And then Lumumba is driven out into a remote clearing late at night, and he's shot dead by a Congolese firing squad commanded by Belgian officers who in turn were answering to the secessionist leaders of that province. And he's killed, and three days later, Kennedy is inaugurated. What are the objects that define espionage? Right now in my hand is a pen with a hidden microphone. If you've got a compass that is concealed inside one of the buttons on your jacket, maybe the Germans won't find it. We're opening the archive and diving deep into their iconic designs. Enigma is one of the most famous code machines of all time. I'm Alice Loxton, and this is A History of the World in Spy Objects, a new series from Spyscape Studios. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So the people who pull the trigger on Patrice Lumumba are Congolese soldiers and Belgian mercenaries. Would you call them mercenaries? The literal trigger pullers are Katangese gendarmes, which is what the military in the secessionist province of Katanga was called. These are Congolese locals. And they were still commanded by Belgian officers because after the mutiny, every other province had Africanized the officer corps except for Katanga, which was independent. So one could call them mercenaries. They were, I believe, getting their paychecks from the Belgian government. 
and they were commanding these Congolese soldiers. And then the ultimate political decision makers on the ground there were the local secessionist leaders, Moise Chambe being the, the president of independent Katanga. But as I explained in the book, you know, a lot of things had to happen for Lumumba to die. A lot of people had to make very particular decisions. And one extremely key decision was Devlin's choice to sit on the news and not intervene to save Lumumba. And I mean, would you add to that Devlin's and the CIA's support for Mobutu all those years? I mean, that seems to be a key factor in the story as well. Yeah. I mean, the CIA supported Mobutu beginning right before the September 1960 coup in which he took power. And the CIA continued, and then the broader US government continued for years and decades. And so it was a key decision in 1960 to back Mobutu and also to contribute to Lumumba's ouster and then eventual death. If you look at the story as a whole, you say a lot of things had to happen for it to turn out the way it did. How important would you say that US policy and the CIA's role was in comparison to all the other kind of big wheels that are turning here? The process of decolonization, Cold War tensions, Soviet intervention at some points, though much more limited than perhaps Washington thought it was, and particularly Belgian interference and also the role of the United Nations. There were all these wheels turning, weren't there? So where would you put the USA's role in there in this sort of awful ending for the member? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There were a lot of actors at play here. The Belgians were also involved in Lumumba's transfer that led to his death. They had been undermining Lumumba while he was in power, even before he was in power, supporting Mobutu. The UN had a peacekeeping mission there and was officially neutral, but in fact contributed to Lumumba's ouster in early September 1960. But the United States was the superpower on the ground. The Soviets were barely present. You know, before independence, the Belgians were the big game in town. After independence, their diplomats were kicked out by Lumumba. And so very quickly, the CIA assumed what I would argue was the most pivotal role on the ground, specifically with all the cash that they were able to provide. Larry Devlin was handing Mobutu briefcases of cash. The exact dollar amounts, interestingly, are still classified. But the CIA had an enormous amount of influence on the ground. And much of that didn't come to light until you know decades later. As you say, Joseph Mobutu went on to rule Congo, which then became Zaire. For 30 plus years, he gave himself a new name, Mobutu Sisiseko, and he was supported as an ally of the United States for, well, right up until the early 90s in an extremely corrupt, very, very brutal regime. Did Larry Devlin ever talk later in life about any of this? Did he ever go public? Did he ever reflect on his role in the origins of the Mobutu regime? He did. He wrote a memoir that came out in 2007. And it's an interesting document in that it gives his version of events. It also leaves out much of the story, parts of the story that in fact would not be declassified until after the publication of that book and after Devlin's death, particularly when it comes to his role in Lumumba's transfer and death. But I mean, Devlin's perspective that he put forward was that this was the Cold War. The United States was locked in an existential struggle with the Soviet Union and difficult decisions had to be made. And Lumumba was a disaster who would have turned the Congo communist. That view, I argue, was an exaggeration. And there were people at the time who particularly in the Kennedy camp, who argued that and thought that Congo was not about to become communist and Lumumba should be brought back to power as prime minister. He did, after all, represent a legitimate strain of Congolese political opinion. But Devlin, you know, he was a true Cold Warrior and viewed his actions as justifiable in the context of the Cold War. And in the book, at the very end of the book, as you are reflecting on what everything that came to pass in Congo, you look back at other... CIA covert operations over the years that took place in the Cold War context. And you seem to feel that the Congo operation under Devlin was sort of a blueprint for other stuff that was to come. Is that right? The Congo operation was viewed as as a success. Devlin was 
promoted for his work in the Congo. He won at least one award for his work in the Congo. So this was viewed as a great thing that had happened. The potentially pro-Soviet leader had been eliminated. A pliant pro-American military leader had been put in his place. What was not to like in the narrow Cold War context that made sense. And so I don't want to make too much of it, but you know, you do then see Bay of Pigs, you see all sorts of CIA meddling across what was then known as the Third World. This wasn't entirely invented in the Congo. There was Iran and Guatemala before that in the at the beginning of the Eisenhower administration, but it was really perfected in the Congo. And this was the first time the United States and the Soviet Union faced off in a place that wasn't near either of them. And so it was the moment, one can argue, that the Cold War truly transformed into a spilled over into the third world. Before then, it had been first and foremost, a, primarily a European affair. And that changed in the Congo. When you look back at the whole thing after the sort of huge experience of spending years writing this book, and you think about CIA and its role, what do you sort of take away from it? I mean, what conclusions do you find yourself coming to about the whole episode, all these events and the role of CIA covert operations? I mean, I think it really shows the danger of paranoia because there really was this extreme fear on the part of the Americans that was ultimately not justified by the facts on the ground. When the Soviet archives were opened up, it turned out that there was not much about the Congo crisis in them because the Soviets didn't really care that much about Congo. They viewed it as a place they could score some propaganda points, but it was a Catholic country that was not amenable to communism. It was very far away. In 1960, the Soviet Union was not as powerful as it would become. And so it was a sort of peripheral interest. If you look at the American cables, however, there's talk of Soviet influence left and right. And so there was this real disconnect between reality and perception. And I mean, I think today the lesson is to you know, not imagine that your geopolitical rivals are 10 feet tall and perfectly capable and active everywhere. That certainly was not the case in the Congo. So I think that's one of the main lessons. And the other is just more specifically about Lumumba himself. I think America fundamentally miscategorized him. They couldn't quite comprehend that being anti-Belgian was not the same as being anti-American. And they couldn't quite understand what African nationalism was and that it need not be at cross purposes with the US interests. Huh. Fascinating. And you traveled to the Democratic Republic of Congo in your research for this book. What did you find there today? And could you see direct links to this past? I mean, was there a legacy of this story? And does it still live on? Lumumba himself very much lives on in the DRC today. He's you know, rightly seen as a father of Congolese independence and nationalism. He's not universally popular, especially in Katanga today. But I think, I mean, the most lasting legacy of this period is the dysfunction that continues to plague the Congo. I mean, there's some interesting parallels. In 1960, you had a dysfunctional authoritarian government after Mobutu took power. Today, you have a dysfunctional authoritarian government. Back then, you had a UN peacekeeping mission trying to restore order over large swaths of the Congo. Today, you have a UN peacekeeping operation trying to do the same. All of that can really, you know, there are many causes of that, of course. History is complicated. But one big cause of it was the 30 plus year rule of Mobutu, who hollowed out the country, prevented any sort of real politics from taking place, stole vast sums of money and left the country in terrible shape such that when his regime collapsed in 1996, 1997, it kicked off this massive civil war. And some of the embers of that have yet to burn out. So sadly, the legacy of the Congo crisis in 1960 today in Congo is continued dysfunction. The book is The Lumumba Plot, The Secret History of the CIA and a Cold War Assassination. The author is Stuart Reed. It's available in the United States and the United Kingdom. Stuart, thanks very, very much indeed for joining us today on Spyberry Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. That's all from us. Tune in again to Spybrary next time.
Thanks for listening to the Spyberry Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.com.